Welcome everyone to the 2021 Mary Milligan Lecture in Spirituality featuring Dr. Susan Abraham and entitled, Blessed Are Those Who Mourn, Depression, Anxiety, and Pain on the Path of an Incarnational Spirituality. I'm Dr. Kim Harris from the Department of Theological Studies, and I'm honored to be hosting tonight as your MC. And just a reminder that we are recording the event this evening, so if you do not wish to be part of that recording, please turn your Zoom camera off. Thank you. First, we would like to thank and honor the peoples of this land, the peoples on whose land we live and work here at LMU and who continue to be among us, the Tongva people. And we, of course, thank and honor the religious sisters of the Sacred Heart of Mary for endowing this lecture, this lecture series in honor of Mary Milligan, RSHM. And we are grateful to the Marymount Institute for Faith, Culture, and the Arts for the beautiful publication. And just another reminder to all of you, if you have questions as we go throughout this time together, please put those questions into the chat and we will be having a question and answer period after the lecture by Dr. Abraham. We are grateful this evening for the musical participation of Chris De Silva, You've already heard his wonderful playing as you came into the Zoom room. Chris is a composer and arranger and a recording artist for GIA Publications. And he is the Associate Director of Music in Campus Ministry here at LMU. And he's always excited to be a part of the journey with our students. Chris will be playing now an arrangement of the hymn tune, Slain an Irish traditional melody that he was inspired to arrange for solo piano during the campus ministry Ignacio Companion immersion trip to Cambodia. I've also been on this trip, it's an incredible one, and we go to the New Hope for Cambodian Children Orphanage. And it is to that wonderful staff and those incredible young people that this piano piece is dedicated. And it is entitled, Hope.
Thank you so much. Thank you, Chris. And now I am pleased to present Dr. Kim Timothy Law Snyder, president of Loyola Marymount University. President Snyder has been a dedicated professor and academic administrator at Jesuit universities for more than 30 years. Under President Snyder's leadership, LMU seeks to create the world we want to live in through inclusivity, creativity, and by extending its global reach with impact. Guided by the university's mission, President Snyder challenges LMU to leverage its creativity and develop new opportunities for interdisciplinary study and to expand LMU's reputational capital by expanding its visibility onto a world stage. His dynamic and forward-thinking style inspires the community, especially to expand the community's leadership in diversity, equity, and inclusion programs. Now, among President Snyder's professional and intellectual and creative pursuits, he is a musician who writes and arranges and records his own music. Please join me in welcoming the 16th president of Loyola Marymount University, president and professor, Timothy Law Snyder. Thank you, Professor Harris. Many wonderful colleagues brought today's lecture and gathering to life, and they deserve our gratitude. I thank our Department of Theological Studies for hosting the 2021 Mary Milligan RSHM Endowed Lecture in Spirituality, and our Marymount Institute for the stunning accompanying publication. I thank Sister Kathleen Kellerman, Provincial Superior of the Religious of the Sacred Heart of Mary, and LMU Trustee Sister Mary Janino, for their leadership, support, and guidance for this lecture. Thanks to all the Marymount Sisters and the Sisters of St. Joseph of Orange for their conviction, compassion, and creativity, which energize our LMU community. And that happens every day with us. I thank each of you present for joining us to celebrate the legacy of Sister Mary Milligan and her visionary insights that synthesize her love for critical reflection on spirituality in service of the church and the world with the charism of the RSHM community that all may have life. Of course, I share my boundless gratitude for and respect to Professor Susan Abraham for her exquisite writing on a topic so timely and essential to healing humanity. When we reflect on the essence of the Marymount sisters, unwavering zeal most certainly comes to our minds. That zeal inspires everything we do and will continue to do at LMU. And it has been at the heart of the mission of the RSHM since their founding, hence the unwavering, which makes this zeal profound. Their outreach to underrepresented and struggling women in times of stress and their solidarity with those in economic and spiritual need are motivated by their timeless commitment to embody Jesus' teaching that all may have life and have it to the full. Hallmarks that enrich our mission at LMU. The Mary Milligan Endowed Lecture in Spirituality connects us to our heritage and to the traditions that invigorate our community. Love for humanity love for our earth, love of an engagement with our creative pulse are indeed central to the RSHM charism infusing this evening's discussion. The Milligan Lecture asks us to reflect upon spirituality in service of the church and the world. And in this season of pandemic, the call to life in its fullness is more pressing than ever. In Professor Abraham's incisive writing and in her conversation with us tonight, we are blessed with a portrait of the ways that spirituality invites us to strive for a deeper life. Professor Abraham's work also provokes us to examine how we might embrace one another in solidarity 
in ways that the RSHM have been doing across the globe and here with each of us. So with all this in mind, I'm pleased to introduce the mind and person behind the 2021 Mary Milligan Endowed Lecture in Spirituality. Susan Abraham is Professor of Theology and Postcolonial Cultures, Vice President of Academic Affairs, and Dean of Faculty at the Pacific School of Religion. She is the author of Identity, Ethics, and Nonviolence in Postcolonial Theory, a Ranarian Theological Assessment, and co-editor of Shoulder to Shoulder, Frontiers in Catholic Feminist Theology. Dean and Professor Abraham's ongoing research examines issues in theological education and formation, interfaith and interreligious initiatives for social transformation, theology and political theory, global Catholicism, and Christianity between colonialism and post-colonialism. Academic Vice President Abraham brings abundant experience and knowledge of higher education and institutional practices through her past affiliations with St. Bonaventure University in New York, Harvard Divinity School, and the place where she really learned what is going on in all of, not just education, but life, Loyola Marymount University. Professor Abraham's courses and presentations weave practical theological insights from her experience as a youth minister in Mumbai, India, with theoretical perspectives from post-colonial theory, cultural studies, political theory, and feminist theory. So I ask that you please join me in welcoming back to LMU for this year's lecture, our beloved colleague and our dear friend, Professor Susan Abraham. Thank you, thank you, thank you. This is, uh, it's marvelous. Um, I think I love you more than you love me, so there. I miss you all. I wish I could be there in person. Um, it is wonderful to see friends, colleagues, students, former students, uh, former teachers uh, on this call. Thank you all humbly. Thank you for being here. I am honored to deliver this lecture. Uh, I know when uh, Professor Michael Horan asked me uh, two years ago now, I was a little bit astonished and I said, Please, not I. I really am not worthy to do this. Uh, but a call is a call, and I wanted to honor it. I wrote this lecture for you in October 2019. And at the time, uh, my beloved colleague and friend, David Sanchez, was on my mind. That's who I was thinking of when I was writing this lecture. But little did I know as I was writing this lecture what was going to be revealed to our world in a few short months. You and I have lost so much in this past year, this year of reckoning, 2020. We have lost so many, so many beloveds, but we have lost them to the only two things that human beings need to be afraid of in the time of the Anthropocene, each other, and a virus, the only two things that could take our life at this moment. We are the Anthropocene. We are in the time of uh, you know, uh, the absolute power of the human being, but we cancel each other out because of our own hate, our own suffering, our own sorrow, and our despair. And then we give rise to processes within a living world that then seeks to ask and to remind us, we are not alone on this planet. We do not rule this life. We live here as guests of a hospitable living system. You might think that because my title, the, the, the talk today is uh, speaking about depression, you might think that I might speak to the ordinary psychological and medical ways in which we think about depression and anxiety. I think there are other more qualified people who can do that. I'm not a medical doctor, but what I want to look at is a, a strand in academic 
theory and academic uh, traditions, which thinks about the experience of time as we struggle with depression and sorrow. Let me explain to you why I'm doing this through a story. I heard this story when I was in the eighth grade in India, and it is one of the stories that really formed the way I think about being in the world and about living in the world. It's the story of a character that is actually not well beloved in the Hindu understanding of the world. Uh, he is a little bit pompous, he's a little bit arrogant, but he also gets things done. So he's some kind of exemplar, but he's not somebody I really liked. His name was Narada, Narada. Now the thing about Narada was that he was an excellent, excellent devotee. He was a great worshiper of the great God Vish Vishnu. His greatest desire in life, Narada's greatest desire in life was that through his prayer and through his austerities, he could bring Vishnu down into the world. Now imagine that. Imagine if you were an, eight year, uh, uh, an eighth grade child listening to this story and thinking that somebody through their prayer can bring God into the world. Today being Today we celebrate the Feast of the Annunciation. This is not an unusual idea in the Asian religious imagination. So in any case, Narada through great prayer brings Vishnu and Vishnu grants him a, a, a vision of, of himself, of his divine self. And Narada says, now that you're here, could you help me understand the nature of reality? Imagine that, the nature of reality, the whole of reality. And Vishnu says, very well then, come with me. And suddenly this road opens up and they're walking along this road. It is under an Indian sun. Now the Indian sun is not a happy sun. It's not like California sun. Uh, the Indian sun is hot, it is oppressive. And they're walking along and Vishnu says, I'm thirsty. But they keep walking along. And I'm sure Narada in his head thought, well, you're God. If you're God, if you're thirsty, conjure up some water from somewhere and drink it. Or make your thirst go away like magic. But the point of the story is to do something to the people who are listening to the story. So Vishnu says to him, see over there, in, you know, over there, right there, there's a little hamlet there. Why don't you go and get me a glass of water? And Narada being obedient because he really wants the big secret of reality, he says, okay, I will go and uh, get you a glass of water. When he said that, a beautiful but cruel smile played on the lips of the great God. Now this is significant. Again, to a, a, to a listener, this idea of the cruel and beautiful smile will come up again in the story. So Narada goes and he comes to this house. He knocks on this door and the door opens and lo and behold, inside the door is this absolutely stunningly beautiful, gorgeous woman. And Narada has, finds that he has lost his voice. He can't speak anymore. And he just stands there blinking. And the woman smiled a beautiful smile. And she says, I've been waiting for you. And he says, you were? And he forgets why he's there. And she says, yes, come in. And he goes in and in an instant, he forgets why he was there in the first place. She introduces him to a family. They have a great time. Well, he stays there, not that evening not the next day, not that week. He stays for 12 years. 12 years pass. In his, in his consciousness, this time passes. He marries her. They have three children. He becomes a very important man in that little village. 
and he forgets all about Vishnu waiting for him for a glass of water. That night, one night after 12 years, there is a sudden and terrible storm. There's a sudden and terrible downpour, so much so that the river breaks its banks. And people run out of their houses saying, run, run, run for your life. A terrible flood is coming, run for your life. So Narada catches hold of his three children and his wife and they run out. But there's water all around. All around them is a flowing river of water and it is strong. He clutches his children, but it is dark, it's raining and the water is rushing. All of a sudden, one of his children slips from his grasp and all he can do is wail in agony as his child, he sees his child flowing away in the river, drowning and dying. But as he's doing that, the other child slips from his hand too. And all of a sudden the river takes that child. Then his wife who was standing in the river right next to him with the third child, falls into the river and all of a sudden she swept away as well. In one instant, his entire beautiful life has disappeared. And he is wailing and crying and shouting, not understanding how this could have happened in this one instant. And he's washed up on the banks of the river. And as he lays there sobbing in agony, all of a sudden he hears a soft voice saying, child, did you bring me some water? That's the story. And you might think, well, what's the point of such a horrible story? They just killed all the children. They, this is a story of horrible suffering, horrible, pointless suffering. But within the Hindu understanding, the fact that you can spend your time as if that is real in the world and forgetting your greater duty, which is to serve God in the world, that idea that we live in order to serve God in the world, that you see was the secret of reality. That is the meaning of Maya within the Hindu system. It's a complex thing. It is a difficult thing to grasp. But what has always fascinated me about this story is, is it's playing with time. And how time, we take time to be real and concrete because it marks so much for us. But what if time is not real in the way that you and I think it is real? What if when we are experiencing the deepest sorrow, the passing of time is not what is the most important thing that we have to focus on? What if when we are experiencing our deepest anxiety and depression, that the most important thing we have to do is to attend to a thirsty God? Next week, Christians around the world will do precisely that. We will stop everything, everything, and we will reflect on Good Friday and wonder about the absolute paradox of a great God hanging on a cross, but also one who thirsts. This is West Asia. The sun is hot. It is not like here. Thirst can kill the sun can kill. And the idea that is in all of these rituals and stories is that what we have to do is to attend to the divine. What we know as depression and anxiety is known to the Christian and Jewish traditions. Psalm 91, for example, talks about the noonday demon. Within the Christian tradition, it is called acedia. It is an affliction of the soul. It is a strange thing because it is so insidious 
it's time, the time in which it expresses itself is interesting. It's called the noonday demon in the Psalms. The demon is so insidious because this demon appears when the, when the sun is absolutely as at its zenith. It's not, a, it's not a demon that hides. It is a demon that reveals itself right in the middle of the day. So this demon knows time. Assyria and the Christian tradition is also identified with boredom. Now, I know a number of uh, my former students and current students, you, you know this, you know this, right? This is an affliction that we all struggle with all the time. But when we are bored or when we're experiencing the noonday plague or when we are, uh, uh, you know, experiencing Assyria, what happens to time is interesting all of a sudden time slows down and you imagine oh it's it must have been five minutes it's 10 minutes since i last looked at the clock and then you look at the clock and lo and behold it has been only one minute what happens to time there is something that is going on with time when we are in these states of mood disturbance David Foster Wallace, you, many of you may know him in his absolutely brilliant uh, address to the graduating class of Kenyon College in 2005, talks about this kind of boredom. He tells them, if you're going to graduate and you're going to become an adult like the rest of us, what you're going to do is to have a nine or 10 hour workday, at the end of which you realize that you have to go to the grocery store because there's no food in your fridge and you desperately hope and pray that there's no crowd at the grocery store. But when you get to the grocery store, everybody and their uncle is over there because everybody had the same idea. After work, I'm going to go to the grocery store. But you go there, it's overcrowded, hideously lit, infused with what he calls soul-killing muzak and corporate pop. And only one or two check checkout lines open. And he says, it's stupid and infuriating, but you can't take your fury out on the frantic lady working at the register who is overworked at a job, whose daily tedium and meaninglessness surpass the imagination of any of us here at a prestigious university. And she says, after you pay, have a nice day in a voice that he says is the voice of absolute death. This is the reality for many, many of us. It's a life of tedium. Wallace, if you may remember, struggled with deep depression and died by suicide in 2008. You might think it's our contemporary world then that is at fault. But no, this sense of losing time has been known within our tradition. Ignatius of Loyola knew this. He called it desolation. And he advised that we lean into it. But he said we should not be too worried about the outcome of leaning into it. Many of us are not good students of the Christian tradition. Uh, we, don't really, uh, we don't really learn from our own tradition. But our tradition has a lot to say about acedia and sadness. Other religions do as well. Judaism, for example, talks about the tears of God, that it is God through God's tears who makes the bridge to bridge the chasm between God and humanity. It is through the tears of God that human beings are reconciled to God. Again, in a week, we will celebrate this intuition now as Christians, but it is an older Jewish intuition that the suffering of God really is the bridge that is built by God for the sake of humanity. This is the meaning of the incarnation. But you might be thinking, well, I don't want to be suffering so much. Speaking about suffering in this positive way is a terrible thing. I want some medication, make it go away, make me happy. To think about suffering in a positive way is insane. But I want to ask you, should we really trust the rational and the sane? I call these particular forms of sanity, the regimes of sanity. They have a quality to them. 
They are self-sufficient. They are autonomous. They are independent. They are perfection-oriented. They are predictable. They are orderly. They are into productivity, organization, and efficiency. They insist on speaking the right language that is precise in its grammar and it is accurate. They are smart, they are clever, they fit. And unlike you and me, they do not, they do not care for broken languages, broken minds and broken hearts. Here I want to ask the question, these regimes of, san uh, of sanity that come to us in our modern times, also need to be interrogated and questioned. Primary, primary principles behind this, these myths of sanity or these myths of self-sufficiency is the idea of autonomous people who don't need anybody else. This is a lie. The coronavirus has shown us how much we need each other. We are sick not just from the virus, we are sick because we can't be with each other. But in this time, there is, an, there is a Muslim, uh, Pakistani Muslim anthropologist that I read very much. His name is Talal Asad. And he talks about pain as being something that can help people become persons. But pain has to be understood as a way to ensoul the world, ensoul, to, to bring the soul into the world. It's like envelope. We have to envelope the world. We have to ensoul the world. When we ensoul the world, whether it is the world of others, short people, tall people, gay people, anybody, the world of others, when we ensoul that world, and we ensoul the world of animals and plants and trees, then we cannot kill them. Then we cannot consume them because they are us. We are them. To be religious in this way is to do strange things, to do queer things. Now I know the word queer might sound as if, you know, I'm going to start talking about sexuality in a minute. Actually, we have to talk about sexuality. We have to talk about reproduction in a certain way. What do you think the virus is doing? The virus's uh, impetus for life is about reproducing itself. It is the logic of life. But for those of us human beings who have a way to understand how this planet works as a system, we have to think about queer, not just in relationship to sexuality, that's very important, but more than. To be queer is to dissolve the binaries of religious and secular, to dissolve the binaries of pain and happiness. Think about it, pain and happiness are often used as opposites but one is actually a dimension of the other. One of the thinkers, the, the last thinker I want to introduce to you today is somebody called Eve Sedgwick, Eve Kosovsky Sedgwick. She was a queer thinker and activist, though she identified as a straight woman. She became, uh, became an activist on behalf of the gay community because of the AIDS crisis. And what she understood there was that we had become so inured to the suffering of certain groups of people that we didn't care that a virus was killing them. AIDS was a pandemic, but because it happened to certain people, we, a lot of other people were, had the luxury of saying, well, you know, it's not really that big a deal. But if we think about it, what it did to us as human beings and what it did to us to ignore the, the significance of that epidemic, what it did to us as human beings, if we think about it, it is a great tragedy. So she began to think about it, but it also dovetailed with something that made her very depressed and sad. Right as she became an activist, she discovered that uh, she was diagnosed with breast cancer. 
This was in 1991. Eve Kosofsky Sedgwick died of, of breast cancer in 2009. So for a long period of time, she struggled with the disease, almost 20 years. And she was seriously, seriously depressed. And one of the things that she said really helped her, uh, she was an atheist, she was a very secular thinker, very academic, very into theory, but what really helped her was to investigate Tibetan Buddhism and to discover that there was a strong sense within that tradition of thinking about death. In fact, as the tradition say, it says, we must contemplate our death every day. And you might think, but this is so depressing. Why do you want to contemplate my death every day? It is because thinking about death infuses your living moment, the living time with something so immeasurably beautiful that life becomes a great preparation to the end. Imagine if, if this were our very last evening on this planet. Imagine if this night were the very last night on this planet. Imagine, imagine how much you would relish hearing, listening, being, thinking. And that is the point of thinking about death. Now, one of the things that Professor Sedgwick left us with was to ask us that the most important thing educators can do is to teach young people to think about death in this way. So she asks us to, to, to find ways of teaching reading where a student, even a very young student, can imagine the end of their own lives. This is not to encourage their death, but it is to encourage them to think about finitude, about ending, and about how ordinary a human experience it is. It is not something to be frightened of. It is not something to be avoided. We, none of us can do that. Uh, and it is something we can prepare for. So educating and living is for us to prepare towards a beautiful death. How will we know that this is what we have to do? How will we know whether this is something we can do. Well, let me read you, in order to end, read you the words of Psalm 91, from which we get the phrase, the noonday demon. Let me read you those words. They move me every time I read them. It's an excerpt. And these words are my prayer for you this evening. You who dwell in the shelter of the Most High, you, each one of you. You who abide in the shadow of the Almighty, you, each one of you. Say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress. May God in whom I trust, for he will rescue you from the snare of the fowler, from the destroying pestilence. With his pinions, he will cover you and under his wings you shall take refuge. His faithfulness is buckler and shield. You shall not fear the terror of the night, nor the arrows that fly by day, nor the pestilence that roams in darkness, nor the devastating plague at noon. Though a thousand fall at your side, 10,000 at your right side, near you, it shall not come. I end with this prayer for each one of you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Abraham. I especially appreciated hearing those words at the end. And now we're going to have responses from uh, some of my wonderful colleagues in the Department of Theological Studies. Dr. Karen Enriquez, Dr. Layla Karst, Dr. Nancy Pineda Madrid, and Dr. Tracy Timar. So 
Dr. Harris, thank you for uh, your introduction to all of us. And maybe we should all just take a moment to really absorb what you just heard from Dr. Abraham. Think about what we just heard, but also check in with how we're feeling about what we've just heard. And I would also like to repeat Dr. Harris's invitation to type your questions uh, that you may have the questions that arise into our chat box. So for me, there are many thoughts in my mind, but I'm gonna try to be really brief um, because I know there's, there's a lot of great conversation to be had, but maybe one piece I wanted to, to kind of continue to think about is in your description about time and also in your description of the regimes of sanity, there's a real sense of, right, that our experiences of time and tedium is, there's a real reduction of our sense of self. Right, that the tedium of time that we just go from one thing to the other, and the sense of self that you know that, that has to be the productive self. If I'm not constantly doing things, I'm not productive and therefore not worthy, and therefore my time is not you know is not valuable if I'm not constantly producing. And there's something about right that relentlessness of the tedium I think that causes a lot of right anxiety, depression, and to me deep right a deeper sense of meaninglessness. But more than that, I think to, to your earlier point about the story of Narada, it also made me think how that also causes us right forgetfulness. That because we're so busy with the, just the day-to-day -day things, right? That we're asked to do in this regime of sanity. We forget what is it that's truly important, right? Narada's question was, this was my deepest desire is to see the face of God. And he lost that, right? And he, right, and he also lost like paying attention to that. And so I'm, I'm, I'm actually thinking about, right, as we think about the richness found in these different traditions that you've mentioned, right, what are some of these practices, right, of I think paying attention, of not becoming forgetful, and with that, right, the importance of memory and how the holding in memory, right, are, are all of these ways that we can kind of go against this regime of sanity and really hold our communal pain so that we can learn to lean into that. And then, right, and, and from that, right, become more active in the world. So I think that's, I apologize if that question was long, mm -hmm. uh, but thank you, uh, Dr. Abraham, for such a wonderful lecture. Thank you. Do you want me to answer each one as we go along? Is that the way we're doing it? I think we can so. do that, or I wonder if others want to jump in and, you know, say, <clears throat> add to it or explain it in other ways that may be useful as well, so that we hear from you. Well, if I had time, I would have read something that um, David Foster uh, Wallace wrote at the end of his address to the students at Kenyon College. And this is what he says, and it's what you said, uh, Dr. Enriquez, which is paying attention is critical because he says, it will actually be within your power to experience in a crowded, hot, slow, consumer type health situation as not only meaningful, but mm -hmm. sacred. Mm -hmm. On fire with the same force that lit the stars compassion, love, and the unity of all things is to be seen even in a supermarket. Mm. So I think the idea is, you know, at LMU, we talk a lot about finding God in all things. Obviously, this is not about some magic. You know, it's not about some, you know, lights and things, you know, it's not about that. It really is about seeing the heartbeat of a star in a parking lot mm -hmm. 
it's it's to live with that kind of a sense in the world so tedium you know tedium happens because we've lost a sense of that we've lost that uh, I, I you know it doesn't matter what we are doing most things that human beings have to do are repetitive and maybe you know all not not all that exciting until we realize that what we are doing is caring for our descendants mm -hmm. caring for this planet and standing within a living tradition so that would be one way to think about medium. Mm -hmm. I think the other thing that you point to so well is the sense or the sense I so identified with your text and your lecture. And I just want to thank you so much. Um, you know, I was thinking about my postpartum depression. I was thinking about this last year. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking about how important you bringing in the notion of time, because my sense of those periods of time was of being stuck in time. And as you and Dr. Enriquez were talking about, not being able to be productive, right? I felt like I was being consumed mm. literally by my children, trying to homeschool, mm. and I couldn't turn the gears again. But then I fall into that trap of the linear time that mm. Narda fell into and that you were talking about. So having this cosmic sense of time is so important and something that religious traditions bring that are oftentimes shut out of the conversation. So I think you speak very importantly about why we need multiple discourses in talking about depression and the, the theological, cosmic, spiritual perspective is so important. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'll jump in here. I I agree. I think that's really an important point. I, um, I, I've been sitting with what you've said about depression, despair, suffering, and uh, over the last week or so, a couple of weeks or so, I've been rereading a book by Carlos Mendoza titled La Resurrección como Anticipación Mesiánica, Duelo, Memoria y Esperanza desde los Sobrevivientes, which is the resurrection as uh, messianic anticipation, grief, memory, hope from the perspective of the survivors. And so he's dealing a lot with grief here. And one of the points that he makes, I think, connects with what you're saying that we, he argues, we don't have the symbols that help us to anticipate a communion mm -hmm. with the dead, precisely because we're in this colonialism that you have mm -hmm. mentioned many times and that one place where we have resources, he, he argues, and I think this is uh, resonant with where you're taking us, is that the original peoples, um, so the native indigenous communities, because their lives have been marked by tragedy for many, 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 many generations. And so they're trying to figure out how to process that grief. And, and he's arguing that that grief needs to be processed publicly, that it can't be simply processed by oneself in isolation. And this is one of the points that you're making. The tedium comes when, I've, when I'm overwhelmed by the pain that I'm experiencing and I isolate myself. But it's in processing it publicly that we're able in a way to, uh, to move to a place where we can find the sweetness and joy in life again, because doing it publicly generates a kind of energy. And I think that's, that's really important. And as a, a theologian who's a Mexican-American, I, I uh, grew up on the ritual of Dia de los Muertos. And I think in many ways, while we think of it perhaps popularly as this very joyous kind of fun time, there's actually a much deeper sensibility with it in terms of uh, a piercing that the, the veil between death and life mm -hmm. and how in piercing that uh, we discover a kind of sober, fragile hope. It's not an optimism, but a hope, a, a fragile hope. And Christian hope is always fragile. And I think that that helps us to, to, uh, to, to take life and to move into a place where we can anticipate joy and being with those who have gone before and who have died and maybe died in very tragic ways. Uh, it's senseless suffering and senseless death, which you've uh, spoken about. So 
those were some of the things that your work had me thinking about as I, I sat with it. And I'm, I'm so grateful to you because it's really helped me to think through uh, these questions, I think, in, in important ways. Thank you. Thank you. Nancy, I want to pick up on that insight about this kind of public nature of working through this stuff, because um, as I think you pointed out, Susan, that is something that has so fallen out of, I think, a Western, particularly a white Western Christianity, um, that there is this long tradition of naming this acedia, right, this suffering, this depression, um, but it is, all, it is so often kind of named in a moralizing, as a moralizing defect, right. or as a, a defect of, of some to some extent, right? Which means that it, it tends to isolate. And when we do lament or grieve, it is most frequently done alone. Right. Um, and so I, I so appreciated the way that you kind of mind the wisdom in mm -hmm. some of these other traditions to call, call us back to these practices, not just of, of attentiveness, like Dr. Enriquez pointed out, right? But um, really these practices of, of lamenting and grief and within the, the Christian tradition, if we're able to, to widen our gaze beyond um, kind of a white neocolonial Christianity to the Dia de los Muertos in, um, in the Mexican tradition to the African spirituals that arose out of our, our own US context, you know, these are, are present in our tradition too, but we've so kind of pressed them to the margins that I think we've almost lost these, these practices mm -hmm. of lamenting and grieving. I was just so struck by the way that your your talk really calls us back to this, retrieving the wisdom of other traditions, but also being more attentive to the wisdom of our own mm -hmm. and not pushing these to the margin um, because they come from marginalized communities or because they don't comport mm -hmm. with how we think we ought to be feeling. We ought not to suffer. We ought not to be grieving, right. um, but to embrace those and the wisdom of those communities. Right. And the traditions also capture, you know, the ambivalence that uh, human beings experience around all of this. Uh, I did not talk today, for example, but it's in the written piece uh, of C.S. Lewis and his experience. When C.S. Mm -hmm. Lewis was younger, he was, you know, he was Mr. Theologian and he was very, very clear on why human beings experience pain. And his thing was pain has a remedial function. It reminds us that we need God. It's all these platitudes. I mean, imagine saying this to, saying, saying this to the people, to the family of the victims in Colorado or in Atlanta right now, and saying, you know, your pain is because you know God wants you to get closer to God. This mm -hmm. is a, it, it's a horrible violence to do that. But he does that in his younger self, and then many decades pass, and he loses his wife to breast cancer. One of the reasons, you know, the, the issue of cancer, you know, and the, the, the depression that arises out of illness is also on my mind. And a couple of thinkers that I talk about experience that. Well, he loses his wife to cancer and then his whole image of God and mm -hmm. of time changes. Mm -hmm. Now God, instead of being good, he said, speaking about good God is like saying abracadabra. It's like some magic um, uh, formula. It doesn't make any sense. It's nonsense. We, that, that's terrible to speak about God because he said, I'm in need right now. I'm knocking on the doors of heaven and this God does not answer me. How can you call this God good? Mm -hmm. And then he says, and look at the time. What has happened to time? He said, I shuffle about here. I shuffle about there. I pick up a cigarette to smoke. I, I put it down. I walk into this room. I don't know what I'm doing in this room. Something has happened to him. So Professor Karst, in exactly what you're saying, we are not very good students, either of our own tradition or of other traditions. And for me, the most important thing is that we become these readers with a generous her hermeneutic that can look at the stories and texts from peoples around the world and see how they have struggled with this very human reality. Mm -hmm. It is not, it, these are not fixable things. You know, uh, I think it was also uh, Professor T. Meyer was talking about this and Professor Pineda Madrid. Uh, the idea of chaos, you know, human beings understand chaos. Chaos is in our lives constantly. In the traditions, there is this great secret that is preserved 
that is looking at us and we are looking at it, but we don't, it doesn't click in our heads that over all that chaos is God. Out of that very chaos, God will bring about creation. I mean, we read the story of Genesis again as if it's magic, but what it is, what it can also be is this very personal sense that out of the darkness, if one wants to call it that, brilliant light is also blinding. So light is not necessarily a good thing. So, but out of what I don't know, out of, out of what I don't know that infuses me, this God will bring about light. This, this God will bring about understanding. This God will bring about meaning. But a lot of it also puts the onus on us to get up and do our work. And this is hard. Uh, the traditions are uncompromising in this regard. That's what they say. It is understandable. God is right there. God weeps with you. But you know, you have to get up and grade that paper. You have to get up and write that article. You have to get up and cook that meal. You have to get up and take care of that person. Yes. That they are uncompromising about. So that's another great mystery that we have to think about together. What does it mean to live in a world where God accompanies us and we have work to do? Thank you so much. I've really appreciated hearing from all of our panelists. And I know that we also have some questions that have come into the chat. So Dr. Haran, are there some questions that you want to uh, point yes, us there, toward? Yes. There've been some great questions that have come in. So um, the, the, there are so many. Uh, I think we there's a pattern though. Um, the, the audience would like to hear a little bit more about um, concept of desolation. Mm -hmm. And also, um, there's a, a kind of a wonderment. Uh, is there any uh, intersection among desolation and racism and hate, mm -hmm. as we're seeing in this season, I suppose in all seasons, but we're certainly seeing evidence of that in this season. So desolation and an intersection among desolation, racism and hate. Wow, uh, we need like two more hours and I need uh, another month to do a bunch more research so that I can talk to you sensibly about these absolutely brilliant questions. Uh, Ignatius defines desolation as the experience of realizing how separated we are from God. Now, think about that. Uh, within the Christian tradition, especially, God is everywhere. So what kind of an experience is that when we think that God is not here with me right now? What is that? That's something that it should hurt our brains uh, to think about that. We, desolation is the opposite of consolation. Desolation is to feel this utter, absolute, abandoned, aloneness but it's not an aloneness uh, because you you know your best friend or your lover or your sister or your mother isn't near you it is this it is this absolute aloneness of being a creature that has no reference point outside of itself now i think there is a huge intersection between that experience of desolation and the way it is expressed as hate. The deeper one sense of being separated from God and therefore separated from one's fellow human beings and one's fellow creatures, the greater the ability to express violent, arrogant, horrible, killing, murderous hate. The whole idea, you know, Talal Rasad, who's this Pakistani Muslim anthropologist that I talked to you about, that's what he says. Our world is crying out for healing in the sense of ensouling that our job is to really, as 
thinkers, as educators, as religious people of any, any kind, our job is to infuse the world with a soul. Imagine a kitten with a soul. Of course, kittens have souls. What am I saying? Uh, imagine, um, you know, grass or trees with souls. What would it mean for us to live in a world like that, that we make this world holy? And that, I think, is uh, the, the vocation, the calling in this time. So, yes, uh, uh, Professor Horan, the connection between desolation and racism and forms of hate is, is deep, is deep. The connection is deep. That's wonderful. Thank you. Uh, there's so many uh, fine questions here, but uh, there, again, there's, there's uh, quite a pattern to uh, this kind of a question. So let me try to summarize the ones that are coming in. Um, how can a person who is already uh, clearly in depression benefit from contemplation on one's death? Yes. Um... Again, I will talk about it in terms of what I have read. Um, so Tal al Assad again talks about the Christian martyrs, you know, and he and there's a reason why he talks about Christian martyrs. He wants to remind secular, I mean, anthropology, one of the most secular of disciplines in the humanities. If they look at religion, it is as outsiders and they will describe what is happening, you know, to those people who are religious. But within that discipline, he speaks as a committed Muslim. And what he says is, if you think about uh, how, um, I just forgot what I was going to say. Um, could you repeat your question again, Professor Oran? Uh, okay, we were, um, it, it's, um, yeah, let me try. So uh, what I think we are after is how can a person who is clearly experiencing depression benefit from the um, contemplation upon death, that daily exercise that you spoke about. Yeah, so the work that uh, Asad points us to is again, this work of asking the question, what, did, what difference did your life make in the world? And, and that's what he speaks of as ensoulment, you know? And he says the Christian martyrs, uh, from a secular perspective, you look at a martyr and you think, what a fool, what a fool to give up your life for this uh, concept that nobody even cares about anymore. Uh, mm -hmm. in, in, in a secular world, nobody cares about God anymore. Why would you want to, why would you want to be a martyr? But if you look at what the traditions are saying, what they're saying is these martyrs were speaking about a very complex form of agency. It is not the agency of the secular enlightenment individualist of Western European Christianity. It is something far more complex. So for somebody who has been experiencing pain, how do you think of pain uh, do you think of it as leading you into victimhood or you, or do you think of it as something that leads you to be an agent of some kind of change? Mm -hmm. And what Talal Asad, again, as I say, he is a secular anthropologist, but he's a committed Muslim. He's asking us to examine our traditions. And he says, pain can be an agent for change. Now, I, I don't want to be, it, I don't want to sound condescending. I, I understand my father suffered from horrible pain as he lay dying and he had pain for over seven years uh, as he lay dying. I would never presume then to tell him that his pain meant something in the world. Katie Cannon has this very felicitous phrase about pain, and she talks about metabolizing pain, that there is within us as human beings, the ability to metabolize and change pain so that it becomes meaningful. Now, how you do that, I don't know, but I know this, 
I will be right there with you as you do it. You are not alone. We mm. are with you as you do it. God bless you. The final um, question is really not a question, but I, I need uh, so much to express what a handful of, of um, audience members have written about, and that is their, um, their pride and their delight in uh, not only hearing uh, the wisdom of your words, but seeing and you, your interaction with this great team of strong women who are members of the Department of Theological Studies. So this part's not in the chat, Susan, but I have to say that I knew Mary Milligan and she was the Dean who hired me at LMU. And I knew her, I knew her personally, but I knew her by her example. And uh, to have the presence of uh, just some of the strong uh, women theologians who uh, are part of theological studies in LMU gathered together uh, in response to you and having you back here uh, has, uh, that's not gone unnoticed in the chat room, in the chat box. So thank you. Um, thank you so much. Thank you. I, I, I do see a lot of questions and I see a lot of uh, uh, former students. Juren, I see you. Uh, but also Professor Kao had a very interesting question about how feminists think about redemptive pain. No, mm -hmm. this is a huge challenge. Again, the mm -hmm. thing is, you know, there is, uh, we, we, are, we, are, we, are, we are pushing against very secular ideas of agency and we are pushing against very secular ideas of health. Uh, Asad will say, no, look at the ones who are sick. They may not be sick just for themselves. They may be sick for the whole world. So, and he points to a number of really interesting examples like Lud Ludwig Wittgenstein, for example. Mm -hmm. And he says, when that man said he was sick, he had taken on so much that he saw was wrong in the world. Mm -hmm. So there's, what we have to challenge here is not pain, but our idea of agency and our idea of health. That's what we need to change. So big questions here, but thank you all so much. Thank you. Mm -hmm. thank you. Yes, indeed. Yes. And thank you, Dr. Abraham. And thank you, panelists. Uh, uh, I th feel like I want to acknowledge that uh, Mary Milligan's brother, Mike, is with us this evening. Oh. And also Jerry, uh, his, uh, her sister, is with us this evening, too. Yes. And now we actually have a special presentation from Dr. Theresia de Vrome, who is a professor of English, as well as the director of the Marymount Institute for Faith and Culture and the Arts, and the editor and founder of the Marymount Institute Press. And so Dr. de Vrome, please. Thank you for your kind uh, introduction, Professor Harris. The cover of the publication of this essay is a painting by Rembrandt von Rijn representing the biblical and apocryphal story of Tobit and his wife. It was painted in 1659. They are waiting for their son to return home from a long and as it turns out, redemptive journey on which he is accompanied by an angel called Raphael. In the painting, we see Tobit is blind Anna is weaving, a dog sits quietly by. The painting depicts many things, among them blindness, despair, seeing, light, women's work, and finally, the redemptive qualities of nature, recognition, and faith. In Susan Abraham's essay, we see and read all these elements as a piece. It is in the spirit of Sister Mary Milligan the tradition of the religious of the Sacred Heart of Mary, the work of our brilliant speaker and her sister and brother responders that we present to Professor Abraham, a signed, numbered, original lithograph by our artist in residence for the Marymount Institute for Faith, Culture, and the Arts, Will Pupa. Its title is Veritas Filia Temporis, or Truth is the Daughter of Time. Mm -hmm. In it, we see a woman in contemplation, 
in nature, who like Susan Abraham writes, and by doing so has the potential to change the world as we know it. Thank you so much. And congratulations, Dr. Abraham. Thank you. We have come to the end of our evening here. So just a few pieces that need to be added. There's some people you might be saying, how do I receive this uh, beautiful and incredible uh, publication? Well, uh, when you registered, if you filled out your address, you will receive information about how to get the publication. And others of you have been asking about the recording of the event. And yes, this event has been recorded and it will be put up on the LMU website in the next few days. It will be on YouTube and you'll receive a follow-up email letting you know about how to access that. We thank you so much for being here. And we said, you know, as we were planning this evening, we said we knew that there had to be two pieces at the very, very end. One is that we're going to give Dr. Abraham the last word. And after that last word, once again, we will have wonderful music as our evening ends provided by Chris De Silva playing his arrangement of What Wondrous Love Is This? Thank you all so much for being here. And Dr. Abraham, you have the last word. Thank you very much, Professor Harris. I do want to thank you and everybody, and also especially Faith Sevilla. Faith, um, I would much rather be running around with you in the background helping with things. So this was really an experience. Um, I want to say very much, my heart and my love is with you all so much. I think about you. And here is my prayer for you. I have colleagues and students from the Pacific School of Religion here on the call, and they've heard me talk about this before, but this is, uh, this is something, another thing that I live with, a principle that I live with. It's from the Talmud, and it's what the Talmud calls us to do. The Talmud says, do not be daunted by the enormity of the world's grief. Do justly now. Love mercy now. Walk humbly now. You are not obligated to complete the work, but neither are you free to abandon it. Thank you and good night. <laughs>